jane austen and her times by geraldine edith mitten dress and fashions jane austen had a lively and natural interest in dress and her letters abound in allusions to fashions new clothes and contrivances for bringing into the mode those that had fallen behind it she cannot have had much chance of seeing new fashions at steventon but when she went to a town her instincts revived during her visit to bath seventeen ninety nine when she was staying with her brother edward and his wife elizabeth and some of their children she writes my cloak has come home i like it very much and can now exclaim with delight like j bond at hay harvest this is what i have been looking for these three years i saw some gauzes in a shop in bath street yesterday at only four pence a yard but they were not so good or so pretty as mine flowers are very much worn and fruit is still more the thing elizabeth has a bunch of strawberries and i have seen grapes cherries plums and apricots there are likewise almonds and raisins french plums and tamarinds at the grocer's but i have never seen any of them in hats a plum or green gauge would cost three shillings cherries and grapes about five i believe but this is at some of the dearest shops the fashion to which she refers was soon carried to excess hannah moore in her diary says that she met women who had on their heads an acre and a half of shrubbery besides slopes grass plats tulip beds clumps of peonies kitchen gardens and greenhouses and she had no doubt that they held in great contempt our roseless heads and leafless necks some ladies carry on their heads a large quantity of fruit and yet they would despise a poor useful member of society who carried it there for the purpose of selling it for bread this fashion continued to increase until it was mimicked by garrick who appeared on the stage with a mass of vegetables on his head and a large carrot hanging from each side and ridicule killed the folly it seems quite certain that fashion which never reached such grotesque monstrosities as in the lifetime of jane austen hardly touched in its extremer modes herself and her sister who kept to the simpler styles with good taste in fact the jest about the grocers shows that jane herself saw the humour of the thing even when living in the very midst of it a most unusual acuteness she describes her own hat in the same letter as being a pretty hat a pretty style of hat too it is something like eliza's only instead of being all straw half of it is narrow purple ribbon which seems simple enough what one would like to get is some mental picture of jane as she appeared indoors and out of doors and this is extremely difficult in the illustration dressing to go out by tomkins we get some idea of everyday fashions the simple style of a plain material with perhaps a little spot or sprig upon it of soft muslin made with a flowing skirt and a chemisette folded in and with sleeves reaching only to the elbow was doubtless the most ordinary kind of indoor dress for women add to this a cap and this is as near as we can get to jane's usual appearance the caps however varied greatly being worn both indoors and also for driving mr austin lee remarks that jane and her sister took to wearing caps earlier in life than was generally the custom but on the contrary caps were worn by very young girls at this period for mrs papendick says in her journal which is contemporary that no young girl of eighteen was seen in public without some head covering of this description we learn many particulars of the different kinds of cap worn by jane from her own letters i have made myself two or three caps to wear of evenings since i came home and they save me a world of torment as to hairdressing which at present gives me no trouble beyond washing and brushing for my long hair is always plaited up out of sight and my short hair curls well enough to want no papering 
i took the liberty a few days ago of asking your black velvet bonnet to lend me its call which it readily did and by which i have been enabled to give a considerable improvement of dignity to the cap which was before too nidgety to please me i still venture to retain the narrow silver round it put twice round without any bow and instead of the black military feather shall put in the calico one as being smarter and besides colico is to be all the fashion this winter after the ball i shall probably make it entirely black i am not to wear my white satin cap to-night after all i am to wear a mameluke cap instead which charles fowl sent to mary and which she lends me it is all the fashion now worn at the opera and by lady mildmay at hackwood balls the word mameluke was used at this time to describe many articles of dress it had come into fashion after nelson's great victory in egypt and there were mameluke cloaks as well as caps but whether these articles of attire bore the most distant resemblance to those worn in egypt or whether the word was tacked on to them merely for the purpose of advertisement i do not know another cap jane mentions seems to have been much more pert miss hare had some pretty caps and is to make me one like one of them only white satin instead of blue it will be satin and lace and a little white flower perking out of the left ear like harriot byron's feather i have allowed her to go as far as one pound sixteen my cap has come home and i like it very much fanny has one also hers is white sarsnet and lace of a different shape from mine more fit for morning carriage wear which is what it is intended for and is in shape exceedingly like our own satin and lace of last winter shaped round the face exactly like it with pipes and more fullness and a round crown inserted behind my cap has a peak in front large full bows of very narrow ribbon old twopenny are the thing one over the right temple perhaps and another at the left ear some ladies used to hang at the back of their turban-like caps four or five ostrich feathers of different colors but apparently a bow or a bit of ribbon sometimes was worn instead of a cap and supposed to represent it just as a bit of wire and gauze a few years ago was supposed to be a toque in one place jane says i wore at the ball your favorite gown a bit of muslin of the same round my head bordered with mrs cooper's band and one little comb the fashion of caps for middle-aged ladies has so recently gone out that it is well remembered but the fashion of nightcaps which belongs to a much older generation seems to us now curious they were then an essential part of a wardrobe henry bickerseth afterwards lord langdale writes to his mother in eighteen hundred i must give you my thanks for the supply of linen you have sent me it was indeed seasonable as that which i had before was completely worn out i am still obliged to solicit some nightcaps he was then only a boy of sixteen and the vision of all the boys in a school going to bed in nightcaps is a funny one headdresses reached their climax of absurdity at the end of the eighteenth century but the styles varied so much that almost every one could please themselves at a famous trial only a few ladies were dressed in the french taste all the rest decked in the finest manner with brocades diamonds and lace had no other headdress but a rib band tied to their hair over which they wore a flat hat adorned with a variety of ornaments it requires much observation to be able to give full account of the great effect produced by this hat it affords the ladies who wear it that arch and roguish air which the winged hat gives to mercury and sir walter besant says the women wore hoods small caps enormous hats tiny milkmaids straw hats hair in curls and flat to the head pom-poms or huge structures two or three feet high with all kinds of decorations ribbons birds nests ships carriages and wagons in gold and silver lace in the erection nothing can be conceived so absurd extravagant fantastical as the present mode of dressing the head 
simplicity and modesty are things so much exploded that the very names are no longer remembered i have just escaped from one of the most fashionable disfigurers and though i charged him to dress me with the greatest simplicity and to have only a very distant eye upon the fashion just enough to avoid the pride of singularity without running into ridiculous excess yet in spite of all these sage didactics i absolutely blush at myself and turn to the glass with as much caution as a vain beauty just risen from the smallpox which cannot be a more disfiguring disease than the present mode of dressing h moore seventeen seventy five but in seventeen eighty seven a great change occurred in the mode of hair-dressing the huge cushions disappeared and the main part of the hair was gathered together at the back in a chignon from which one or two loose curls were allowed to escape the long feathers which have already been commented on varied in number from three to one and continued to be worn well on into the nineteenth century these feathers appeared in turbans bonnets and head-dresses of all kinds and hardly a picture of the period representing ladies at a card-table does not show one or more of these ludicrous quivering monstrosities samuel rogers says that he had been to Rainlaw in a coach with a lady who was obliged to sit on a stool on the floor of the coach on account of the height of her headdress fantastic headgear was not in jane's line all the accounts of her hats and bonnets are simple my mother has ordered a new bonnet and so have i both white strip trimmed with white ribbon i find my straw bonnet looking very much like other people's and quite as smart bonnets of cambric muslin are a good deal worn and some of them are very pretty but i shall defer one of that sort until your arrival in the last ten years of the century poke bonnets and dunstable hats were much in evidence and with flowing curls and flowing ribbons tied in a large bow under the chin were sometimes not unbecoming to a pretty face but in jane's lifetime the strangest fashion that ever caused discomfort to a whole nation gradually died down that is to say the use of wigs yet that they were worn so late as eighteen fourteen is shown by jane's remark in one of the letters my brother and edward his son arrived last night their business is about teeth and wigs nothing quickened the departure of the wig so much as the tax put on hair powder by pitt in seventeen eighty five people argued that they did not mind the money but they thought it so iniquitous to tax powder that they left off wearing powdered wigs to spite the government and probably once having discovered the comfort of doing without these hideous evils they would never return to them yet that the wig even in its heyday was not universally worn is shown by the fact that king george the third himself refused to wear one the king's hair which is very thick and of the finest light colour tied behind with a ribband and dressed by the hand of the queen is one of his most striking ornaments notwithstanding this the peruke makers have presented an address to the king requesting his majesty that for the good of their body and the nation he would be pleased to wear a wig grosley no one has given a better account of the wig than sir walter besant he says the wig was a great leveller with the wig it mattered nothing whether one was bald or not again the wig was a great protection for the head it saved the wearer from the effects of cold draughts it was part of the comfort of the age like the sash window and the wainscoted wall and the wig too like the coat and the waistcoat was a means of showing the wealth of its owner because a wig of the best kind new properly curled and combed cost a large sum of money practically it was indestructible and with certain alterations descended first it was left by will to son or heir next it was given to the coachman then with alterations to the gardener then it went to the second-hand people in monmouth street whence it continued a downward course until it finally entered upon its last career of usefulness in the shoe-black's box 
there was lastly an excellent reason why in the eighteenth century it was found more convenient to wear a wig than the natural hair those of the lower classes who were not in domestic service wore their own hair their heads were filled with vermin these vermin were very easily caught now the man who shaved his head and wore a wig was free of this danger london in the eighteenth century we know that dr johnson's wigs were a constant source of trouble for they were not only dirty and unkempt but generally burnt away in the front for being very near-sighted he often put his head into the candle when poring over his books whenever he was staying with the thralls therefore the butler used to waylay him as he passed in to dinner and pull off the wig on his head replacing it with a new one ladies rarely appeared without headdresses of some kind be it only a bow or an ornamental comb they seemed to think that a woman should be seen with her head covered in every place as well as in church near the end of cecilia the flighty lady honoria cries why you know sir as to caps and wigs they are very serious things for we should look mighty droll figures to go about bareheaded which shows how entirely custom dictates what appears mighty droll or quite ordinary wigs were sometimes the cause of ludicrous incidents as when in the house of commons lord north suddenly rising from his seat and going out bore off on the hilt of his sword the wig of well-bore ellis who happened to be stooping forward many people when wigs began to go out of fashion powdered their own hair and of this bezant gives us also an unpleasant but speaking picture among the minor miseries of life is to be mentioned the slipping and sliding of lumps of the powder and pomatum from the head down to the plate at dinner even boys at school wore cues of a master at eton it is said that his management of the boys excellent in other respects was in some things amiss for he burnt all their ruffles and cut off their cues the times of april fourteenth seventeen ninety five mentions that a numerous club has been formed in lambeth called the crop club every member of which on his entrance is obliged to have his head docked as close as the duke of bridgewater's old bay coach horses this assemblage is instituted for the purpose of opposing or rather evading the tax on powdered heads the use of powder is mentioned in jane austen's story the watsons and is one of the very few touches she gives that carry us backward in time mrs robert watson is speaking to her sisters-in-law i would not make you wait said she so i put on the first thing i met with i am afraid i am a sad figure my dear mr w addressing her husband you have not put any fresh powder in your hair no i do not intend it i think there is powder enough in my hair for my wife and sisters indeed you ought to make some alteration in your dress before dinner when you are out visiting though you do not at home nonsense dinner came and except when mrs robert looked at her husband's head she continued gay and flippant later when tom musgrave arrives robert watson stealing a view of his own head in an opposite glass said with equal civility you cannot be more in dishabille than myself we got here so late that i had not time even to put a little fresh powder in my hair the powders used were very various and now we are upon vanities what do you think is the reigning mode as to powder only turmeric that coarse dye that stains yellow it falls out of the hair and stains the skin so that every pretty lady must look as yellow as a crocus which i suppose will come a better compliment than as white as a lily mrs papendick flour was frequently used for powdering heads and in seventeen ninety five flour was very scarce and enormously valuable in the same year when the powder tax was passed the privy council implored all families to abjure puddings and pies and declared their own intention to have only fish meat vegetables and household bread made partly of rye it was recommended that one quartern loaf per head per week should be a maximum allowance the loaf was to be brought on the table for each to help himself that none be wasted the king himself had none but household bread on his table in eighteen o one the government offered bounties on the importation of all kinds of grain and flour 
and it passed the brown bread act eighteen hundred forbidding the sale of wheaten bread or new bread of any kind as stale bread would go further mary bateson in social england the scarcity and dearness of bread is a thing never felt in the present day when lumps of the best white bread are flung in heaps in the squares and streets of london and disdained even by tramps and beggars and when boys in the north country go round with sacks begging bits of bread which they afterwards use for feeding ponies or horses many epigrams and bon mots were made on the new powder tax a tax on dogs had at that time been generally expected so one wit wrote full many a chance or dire mishap oft times twixt the lip and the cup is the tax that should have hung our dogs excuses them and falls on puppies of the inconveniences attending the use of powder the following anecdote is an instance at one of lady crewe's dinner parties grattan after talking very delightfully for some time all at once seemed disconcerted and sunk into silence i asked his daughter who was sitting next to me the reason of this oh she replied he has just found out that he has come here in his powdering coat samuel rogers table talk the act claimed one guinea a year from every user of powder and was calculated to bring in about four hundred thousand pounds per annum the royal family clergymen whose incomes were under a hundred pounds subalterns and all below that rank in the army officers in the navy under the rank of commander and all below the two eldest unmarried daughters of a family were exempt walter savage lander was the first of undergraduates at oxford to do without powder and was told he would be stoned for a republican the regular academic costume so late as seventeen ninety nine consisted of knee breeches of any colour and white stockings the sun of wigs had not even then set they covered the craniums of nearly all dons and heads of houses the gentlemen wore their hair tied up behind in a thin loop called a pigtail footmen wore their hair tied up behind in a thick loop called a hoop sydney england and the english in regard to the rest of the costume of ladies the most noticeable points of the mode were the high waists and long flowing skirts clinging tightly to the figure this if not carried to excess was certainly becoming but fashion cannot be content with mediocrity it must be extravagant consequently with very low bodices and very high waists came very scanty clothing with an absence of petticoat a fashion which left very little of the form to the imagination i do not say that our english belles went to the extent of some of their french sisters of having their muslin dresses put on damp and holding them tight to their figures till they dried so as absolutely to mould them to their form but their clothes were of the scantiest and as years succeeded year this fashion developed if one can call diminution of clothing development john ashton old times it is difficult to give any consecutive account of fashions extending over such a long period for they varied as frequently then as they do now however here are a few notes colico that is poppy colour was very fashionable jane as we have seen adopted it at one time no lady's dress was considered complete without a dash of coquelico in sash or trimmings jane frequently mentions her cloak this would not be what ladies call a cloak now but more what would be described as a fichu or tippet covering the shoulders and having long ends which fell like a stole in front some of the modern fur stoles are in fact made very much on the same pattern no lady's wardrobe seems to have been complete without at least one black silk cloak of this sort dresses were cut low in front either in v-shape or curved and even in winter this custom was followed a silk handkerchief was sometimes folded crosswise over the opening but very generally though warmly dressed in other respects a lady had her neck quite uncovered the short sleeves which went with low necks necessitated the use of long gloves which reached above the elbow and were tied there with ribbon the high waists made the bodice of the dress so small that it was of very little consequence 
and sometimes was formed merely by a folded bit of material like a fichu this was covered by that fashionable and characteristic garment the police it was not considered proper for very young girls to wear pelisses they wore cloaks but the police did not really differ very greatly from the cloak for it was like a long open coat fitting closely to the arm but falling straight in long ends from the armholes thus leaving the front of the dress exposed in a panel later pelisses became more voluminous and completely covered the dress fastening in front mrs papendick says the outdoor equipment in those days when pelisses and great coats of woollen were not worn by girls was a black cloak of a silk called mode stiff glossy wadded armholes with a sleeve to the wrist from them a small muff and a quaker-shaped bonnet all of the same material huge muffs were very common and this is one of the features of the dress of that date which is generally remembered because of its singularity the small girls were dressed in long skirts plainly made and their robes must have precluded any possibility of romping the short skirts and long stocking the legs of our present mode would have made them stare indeed as for the materials for dresses they were of course much less varied than the inventions of printing and machinery allow women to use nowadays plain muslims or muslims embroidered at the edge were most common though there were other materials such as taffeta sarsnet and bombazine we must realize also that any lace used in trimming must have been real lace there was no machine-made stuff at two and three-fourths pence a yard with which every servant girl could deck herself as she does now india muslims were extremely popular and seemed to have been worn quite regardless of the climate which according to accounts our grandmothers notwithstanding does not seem to have changed remarkably when lady newdigate was at brighton in seventeen ninety seven she writes to her husband do ask of your female cronies if they have any wants in the muslim way nothing else is worn in gowns by any rank of people but i don't know that i can get them cheaper here but great choice there is very beautiful and real india in january eighteen o one jane writes from steventon i shall want two new coloured gowns for the summer for my pink one will not do more than clear me from steventon i shall not trouble you however to get more than one of them and that is to be a plain brown cambric muslin for morning wear the other which is to be a very pretty yellow and white cloud i mean to buy in bath buy two brown ones if you please and both of a length but one longer than the other it is for a tall woman seven yards for my mother seven yards and a half for me a dark brown but the kind of brown is left to your own choice and i had rather they were different as it will be always something to say to dispute about which is the prettiest they must be cam same time if it should not suit you you must not think yourself at all obliged to take it it is only three and six per yard and i should not in the least mind taking the whole in texture it is just what we prefer but its resemblance to green crewels i must own is not great for the pattern is a small red spot that silly and affected nomenclature for the dress fabrics was in use then as it is still is apparent from hannah moore's remark one lady asked what was the newest color the other answered that the most truly fashionable silk was a sucon de verre lined with a super étouffé et brodé de les porons now you must not consult your old-fashioned dictionary for the word les porons for you will there find that it means nothing but hope whereas esperance in the new language of the time means rosebuds the most particular description of a dress jane ever gives is almost minute enough to be followed by a dressmaker it is to be a round gown with a jacket and a frock front to open at the side the jacket is all in one with the body and comes as far as the pocket holes about half a quarter of a yard deep i suppose all the way round cut off straight at the corners with a broad hem 
no fullness appears either in the body or the flap the back is quite plain and the side equally so the front is sloped round to the bosom and drawn in and there is to be a frill of the same to put on occasionally when all one's handkerchiefs are dirty which frill must fall back she is to put two breaths and a half in the tail and no gores gores not being so much worn as they were there is nothing new in the sleeves they are to be plain with a fullness of the same falling down and gathered up underneath low in the back behind and a belt of the same it is of course most obvious that the ludicrous fashions and enormous erections which were carried by the leaders of fashion did not affect quiet country girls just as in our own time the distorted sleeves or ever-changing skirts and all the vagaries of the smart set are known and seen by hundreds who daily go about in perfectly simple clothes which yet cannot be called unfashionable because they conform in main points to the dictates of the fashion of the moment without going to excess two more characteristic quotations from the letters must be given how do you like your flounce we have seen only plain flounces i hope you have not cut off the train of your bombazine i cannot reconcile myself to giving them up as morning gowns they are so very sweet by candlelight i would rather sacrifice my blue one for that purpose in short i do not know and i do not care and in the following year i have determined to trim my lilac sars knit with lilac satin ribbon just as my chine crepe is sixpenny width at bottom threepenny or fourpenny at top ribbon trimmings are all the fashion at bath with this addition it will be a very useful gown happy to go anywhere in one small point the lady of the eighteenth century resembled her successor of to-day the times of november nine seventeen ninety nine notes what is still more remarkable is the total abjuration of the female pocket every fashionable fair carries her purse in her work-bag and she has the pleasure of laying everything that belongs to her upon the table wherever she goes hoops were worn in court dress long after they were abandoned elsewhere some one describes them as the excrescences and balconies with which modern hoydens overwhelm and barricade their persons apart from this survival at court dress was generally long and clinging at one of the drawing-rooms of seventeen ninety six crape was all the fashion princess augusta was dressed in a rich gold embroidered crape petticoat in leaves across intersected with blue painted foil in shaded spots having the appearance of stripes from top to bottom ornamented with a rich embroidered border in festoons of blue shaded satin and gold spangles pocket holes ornamented with broad gold lace and blue embroidered satin bows white and gold body and train there are many other costumes described at the same drawing-room from which we gather that the hair was dressed very full and high and quite off the ears and that bandeaus of gold or silver lace or black velvet imported with gold were run through it gold and silver artificial flowers were also very commonly worn and some ladies had plumes there were also a few caps the ladies all wore full dress neckerchiefs with point lace sufficiently open to display irresistible charms men's dress of the same period was most magnificent and perhaps the feature of it that would strike one most in contrast with modern fashions would be its variety of color coats and waistcoats were always colored black was only donned for mourning gold and silver lace and figured brocades with lace cuffs and ruffles were essential to a bow horace walpole notes at the wedding of a nephew that except for himself there wasn't a bit of gold lace anywhere in the dress of the men and he considered it altogether as a very poor affair a fairly good idea of the different degrees of plainness and ornament in the clothes worn by gentlemen may be gathered from reynolds portrait group of inigo jones hon h fane and c blair which was done at this time the following is the wardrobe of a fashionable man of the time my wardrobe consisted of five fashionable coats full mounted 
two of which were plain one of cut velvet one trimmed with gold and another with silver lace two frocks one of which was drab with large plate buttons the other of blue with gold binding one waistcoat of gold brocade one of blue satin embroidered with silver one of green silk trimmed with broad figured gold lace one of black silk with fringes one of white satin one of black cloth and one of scarlet six pairs of cloth breeches one pair of crimson and another of black velvet twelve pair of white silk stockings as many of black silk and the same number of fine cotton one hat laced with gold point d'espagne another with silver lace scalloped a third gold binding and a fourth plain three dozen of fine ruffled shirts as many neck cloths one dozen of cambric handkerchiefs and the like number of silk a gold watch with a chased case it was the fashion to wear two watches at one time during the century two valuable diamond rings two morning swords one with a silver handle and a fourth cut steel inlaid with gold a diamond stock buckle and a set of stone buckles for the knees and shoes a pair of silver mounted pistols with rich housings a gold-headed cane and a snuff box of tortoise shell mounted with gold having the picture of a lady on the top in the new guide already quoted the following account is put into the mouth of a young gentleman of fashion i ride in a chair with my hands in a muff and have bought a silk coat and embroidered the cuff but the weather was cold and the coat it was thin so the tailor advised me to line it with skin but what with my nevernois hat can compare bagwig and lace ruffles and black solitaire and what can a man of true fashion denote like an ell of good ribbon tied under the throat my buckles and box are in exquisite taste the one is of paper the other of paste fox when a very young man was a prodigious dandy wearing a little odd french hat shoes with red heels and so forth he and lord carlyle once travelled from paris to lyon for the express purpose of buying waistcoats and during the whole journey they talked about nothing else s rogers table talk jane austen's brother edward would dress as befitted his position with greater variety of colour and style than his clergyman father and brother it was the usual thing for a clergyman to dress in black with knee breeches and white stock but it was not essential in northanger abbey when henry tilney is first introduced to catherine in the lower rooms at bath there is nothing in his attire to indicate that he is a clergyman a fact which she only learns subsequently in ordinary civilian dress men wore long green blue or brown cloth coats with stocks and frilled ruffles in the man of feeling a man casually met with is wearing a brownish coat with a narrow gold edging and his companion an old green frock with a buff-coloured waistcoat while an ex-footman trying to play the gentleman has on a white frock and a red laced waistcoat at that time footgear for men consisted of slippers in the house and riding boots for out of doors when beau nash was forming the assemblies at bath as has been said he made a dead set against the habit some men had of wearing boots in the dancing room the gentleman's boots also made a very desperate stand against him the country squires were by no means submissive to his usurpations and probably his authority alone would never have carried him through had he not reinforced it with ridicule his ridicule took the form of a squib one verse of which was as follows come trollops and slatterns cocked hats and white aprons this best our modesty suits for why should not we in dress be as free as hogs norton squires in boots the keenness severity and particularly the good rhymes of this little morceau which was at that time highly relished by many of the nobility at bath gained him a temporary triumph but to push his victories he got up a puppet show in which punch came in booted and spurred in the character of a country squire 
when told to pull off his boots he replies why madam you may as well bid me pull off my legs i never go without boots i never ride i never dance without them and this piece of politeness is quite the thing in bath we always dance at our town in boots and the ladies often move minuets in riding boots from this time few ventured to appear at the assemblies in bath in riding dress life of nash seventeen seventy two end of dress and fashions 